So my presentation is going to be based on my work with uh, Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub, and Ivan Werning. When we start uh, working on this project uh, back in March, um, when the pandemic starts spreading uh, in the US and all over the world, and uh, the original, uh, um, uh, original issue, of course, was uh, how do we think about the pandemic in a macro model in order to think about possible policy that can uh, help uh, uh, dampening the adverse effect of the pandemic. And at the time, governments and central bankers all around the world were thinking about different type of policy, and there still are, to try to help the economy. But the first fundamental question behind any monetary policy or any fiscal policy is, uh, should we do any demand stimulus, uh, given uh, the type of shock that hit the economy? Um, and then if so, if this is the case, then we can start thinking about what is the best and most effective way of helping the economy. So the, the, the debate started uh, to be framed in the, in the context of the standard macro model as uh, whether the pandemic uh, was primarily a shock affecting the aggregate demand side of the economy or the aggregate supply side of the economy. However, we know that in a macro, more uh, rich macro model, demand and supply are interlinked. And what we want to emphasize, what I'm going to emphasize in my presentation is that when the pandemic is the shock that hit the economy, this becomes particularly important. And so it's too simplistic to frame the question in terms of demand versus supply shock. In particular, what is why I'm saying the pandemic is a particular shock? So the defining feature of the pandemic, uh, according to our, to our view, is that uh, the pandemic is, a, is an asymmetric shock. So it's a shock that needs to be thought of in a multi-sector model because it's a shock that hits some sectors in a direct way and some other sector not at all in a direct way. I mean, it can still affect others. So when I'm thinking of what are the sectors that are directly affected, those are the sectors that require some personal interaction, some contact. And so where there is fear of uh, uh, spreading the virus, if there is trading, and uh, there are other sectors that can well operate without any personal interaction and, and then are not hit directly by the shock, but they still could be affected by the shock, but only indirectly. And so our question then is, uh, I mean, there are these sectors where there is a high contact, that, that are high contact intensive, where actually it may be good, it is probably good that the activity goes down, so there is a reduction in the output and activity that is efficient, but the question is, when the shock propagates to the rest of the economy, to the other sectors, uh, does this generate actually inefficient shortage in demand? And uh, uh, we are going to label Keynesian supply shock a type of shock that is uh, on the supply side directly on some sector, but propagates to the others, generating demand shortages that may dominate the, the, the strength of the original supply effect. And when I talk about supply shock, I mean supply shock in a macro sense. So I mean a shock that reduces the efficient level of activity in that sense. Okay. So um, when is that a, Keynesian, a pandemic? Why could be that the pandemic is a Keynesian supply shock? And in our paper, we emphasize different ingredients in a macro model that can amplify this demand shortages effect and so make uh, a Keynesian supply shock uh, even more plausible. Uh, the two main uh, um, uh, components that we emphasize are uh, uh, complementary um, complementarities across sectors and uh, incomplete market. But there are other uh, things that we talk about in the paper, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on them a little at the end. Some of them, uh, the presence of input output linkages across sectors can actually amplify the complementarities across sectors. The possibility of business exit cascades or job match destructions may all be ingredients that uh, can generate the demand shortage uh, um, amplification. So now let me start giving you the main the mechanism of our uh, model. Um, let's think about two sectors. Sector A, which is uh, the high content in intensive sector. And sector B, which is which doesn't doesn't require any personal interaction. Uh, so of course it's an extreme world. In reality, we have multiple sectors, but it's gonna be enough for me to give you the mechanism. So there are gonna be uh, workers in sector A, workers in sector B. This is like before the shock, everybody's working, gets income from its sector and spend in both sectors. Now the question is uh, how do we think about the pandemic? 
we are going to think about the pandemic as a complete shutdown of sector A. And so what's going to happen is that basically we don't have any more income going to the workers and nobody can spend anymore in sector A. How do we think about that? Uh, well, you can think in a sim very simple way about that as at the beginning of full lockdown. So sector A just is shut down by the government. But you can think about this also as in the absence of lockdown policies, uh, just uh, as a de decrease in the level of, act of activity in the sector, either because there is a reduction in the supply of labor, because maybe people are worried of, uh, of working in person, or because there is a re reduction in demand for those goods because of a preference shock, because people are just worried to go to the restaurant because they're afraid to get infected. Okay, so this is an extreme way now activity completely shut. And then the that we ask is uh, what happened to sector B? And in particular, let's assume first that there is a um, there are complete markets. So sector A workers are insured against this shock, so they can actually spend uh, in sector B. In sector B workers still there get income and can spend still in sector B. The question is now the demand in sector B is going to be lower, the same or more than before the shock. And now this depends in a complete market version of the model, depends uh, purely on the strength of the complementarity of the good produced in sector B and sector A, relatively to the intertemporal elasticity of the supply. So for example, think about sector A being restaurants. Restaurants, activity in restaurants goes down. What happens to takeout food or grocery stores? Maybe there, there is actually an increase in demand because a grocery store or takeout food is a good substitute for restaurants. But on the other hand, there may be other sectors that are more complementary uh, to the going to the restaurants. For example, think about uh, fancy clothing, online shopping. Maybe you are going to reduce, buy less clothes if you go out less. And so the question becomes, uh, overall, are these complementarity stronger if the complementarity stronger it may be that overall you will see a drop in demand for sector if it is stronger you may see an increase in sector b and, and this graph here uh, represent the parameter space where actually Keynesian supply is shock happens which means that actually epsilon that in we will see is the elasticity of intratemporal substitution is small enough relatively now let me introduce on top of that incomplete markets What's going to happen then? Well, if we introduce incomplete markets, what happens? We lose the transfers between workers in sectors B and workers in sector A. So now workers in sector A don't get any income because sector A shut down. And uh, let's assume an extreme version of incomplete market. They cannot borrow at all, so they cannot spend anything. Now we have only workers in sector B spending in sector B goods. So even in the case, so you can see that there is going to be a drop in a further drop in demand beyond the fact of the substitutability versus cases where sector B good substitute. So that in complete market version of the model, there would be no Keynesian supply shock. Actually, maybe that the lack of income for the worker the, of insurance for workers in sector A may uh, make demand shortages uh, dominate. And you can see here that we have a larger parameter space where Keynesian supply shock. Now, how, so, so far I was talking about complementarity and substitutability in the goods in terms of preferences, but it may be that the complementarity across sectors, as I was mentioning before, is stronger if we consider input output linkages across sectors. So in particular, think about restaurants now, where they used to demand dishwashing machine or a repair service, accounting services. And now this uh, demand is gonna be not is not gonna be there anymore because uh, restaurants are closed. So then uh, the sector B is gonna see a drop, a further drop in demand coming from the lack of demand for intermediate inputs that they produce. And this makes the parameter space even larger. Okay. So let me go in a little bit more details uh, in the model. Um, we have uh, two sectors, sector A and sector B, and uh, uh, they are the consumption is aggregated according to a CS, where epsilon, as I was mentioning before, is the elasticity of intratemporal substitution across sectors, and 
sigma is the standard elasticity of intertemporal substitution. There is a linear technology in both sectors, so one to one from labor to uh, output. In the continuum of measure one of workers, each one of them has a labor endowment given by n bar. Now there is a, among all the workers, five of them, a measure five of them are going to be attached to sector A. So they specialized in the production of sector A. And a fraction one minus five, minus five of them is going to specialize in sector B. This means that in this baseline version of the model, labor is immobile. In the paper, we also study the case where we relax this assumption and we consider also the other extreme where there is fully mobile labor. As long as there is some degree of immobility, as long as the, the, all the messages are going to go through. Uh, now, uh, what happened, the, what is the asset that the, the agents have access to? Only one asset, one period bonds in zero net supply. So the budget constraints of these workers is uh, uh, simply the following. So what are they spending? They spending good A, good B, and in assets. And the resources are labor income and the returns on their initial asset position. Of the workers, there is a fraction mu. This is the way in which we model in complete market. Uh, there is a fraction mu of the workers that face an extreme borrowing constraint, meaning they cannot borrow at all. Okay. And we are gonna, uh, so this is a, a very special way of uh, representing uh, incomplete market. In the appendix of the paper, we show that all the results go through in the more general version of uh, market uh, incompleteness. But this is uh, this this uh, way of formalizing incomplete markets is uh, uh, makes it uh, very tractable and also allows us to do this uh, um, uh, in limit case uh, that uh, like moving mu from zero to in, into one uh, to span all the possible degree of market incomplete. So um, there are two possible limit cases that are interesting. One is when epsilon goes to infinity. Basically, the two goods are perfect substitutes. It's like there is one sector model. The other limit is when mu goes to zero, which is the limit where we are going to converge to a situation where nobody is constrained, which is equivalent in the aggregate to a complete market version of a representative agent model. So uh, now let's think about the shock. How do we think about the pandemic? The pandemic is an MIT shock, so an unexpected shock that is going to hit the economy only for one period. So at time zero, we start in steady state and everybody has zero assets. So we're going to start from a situation where nobody, uh, everybody has zero assets. And then at time zero, we are going to have this temporary shutdown of sector A. In terms of our model, this means that all the five workers who are uh, specialized in producing in sector A are going to suddenly get an endow labor endowment goes to zero. Okay? And then from time one on, we are going to go back to normal to a flexible price allocation. Now, the question of whether this pandemic is a Keynesian supply shock or not uh, is going to be framed in the following way. They're going to say they're going to be downward rigid nominal wages. And let's assume that the central bank keep the interest rate unchanged. In that case, at time zero, is there is there excess demand or insufficient demand? Okay. If there is insufficient demand, then this means that the pandemic is a Keynesian supply shock. Otherwise, it's a standard supply shock. And the question can be also framed in a different way. Instead of saying central bank keep the interest rate unchanged, you can think: How about if the central bank try to uh, uh, achieve full uh, full employment is the natural rate going up or down. Okay, so um, let me start from the one sector version of the model. So epsilon going to infinity. In that case, a negative supply shock always generate uh, excess demand. So it's a standard supply shock. There is no possibility for change a supply shock. With or without in com complete markets. Why is that? Because uh, if uh, the shock is temporary, so if we have one sector, what's happening is simply that agents are going to see that shock uh, as a good news about the future. They just have a negative income today and they expect a higher future income. So what the agents want to do is to borrow. And in the incomplete market version of the model, what happens is that agents, some of the agents may not be able to borrow. So, well, 
that's too bad for them, but this never means that they are going to be saving, going overshooting the other direction. So at the limit, what's going to happen is when mu is going to one, is that there is going to be no excess demand, but we are not never going to go the other way around where there is a shortage of demand. So how about when you introduce multiple sectors? Now let's start with introducing multiple sectors with the complete market. Okay. In that case, uh, we are going to have uh, that the supp negative supply shock can generate demand shortage if and only if sigma is greater than epsilon. And this is the graph that I showed you at the beginning. So we have the elasticity of intertemporal substitution on the y axis, the elasticity of intratemporal substitution on the x axis, and you can see that the purple area is where change in supply shock arises. So what is that? that you have a, a shortage in demand when epsilon is small and sigma is high. But there are two forces in, in this model that are uh, opposite uh, in, in opposite direction, and then it, it depends on which force dominate is going to give us if there is shortage in demand or not. On the one hand, when sh sector, one, sector A shut down, what's going to happen? Uh, well, there are some goods are not going to be available. So people, so the, the, the shadow price of these goods is like spiking to infinity. So what does it mean that uh, people know that now they can only consume a good B, and so they may decide if they uh, are, uh, if they like intertemporal uh, substituting now, they may decide to, to save today to consume more tomorrow when good A is going to be available again. People may prefer not to do, not to spend too much in takeout now to go to more to restaurants when they're going to be available. Okay. And you can see something from the standard earlier equation that's going to happen is that the relative price today are going to go up because of the shadow price of the goods A. And so this means that you want to uh, save. And, and by how much, it's going to depend on this sigma here. On the other hand, we have the other force, which is uh, you want to spend more in good B because it's true today there are no good A anymore. This means that good B becomes relatively cheap. Okay, and so people wanna, if they're relatively good substitute, they wanna spend uh, a little bit more in B. But of course, how much? Well, this depends on the degree of elasticity of uh, intratemporal substitute. And depending on which force dominate, it may be that people decide that they overall uh, prefer to spend less today and wait for good A being available tomorrow, which is gonna be the case of our uh, shortage in demand. Or it may be that instead, uh, good visits, good uh, substitute, good enough that they prefer to spend more. Now, how about when we introduce incomplete markets? As I mentioned before, when we introduce incomplete markets in our model, set the, the, the workers who work in sector A and who, who lose their income, of those, there may be some of them that do not. Uh, have access to uh, credit markets, so they cannot borrow. So in that case, you're going to be this uh, further amplification in uh, in the drop in demand, and so this increases the um, the space of the um, Keynesian uh, supply shock. If uh, uh, mu goes to one, and as mu increases, this area becomes bigger. In fact, if mu goes to one, we are going to have this horizontal. Okay, so these are the main baseline results. So now the question is, uh, uh, now the question is, uh, uh, well, let's first uh, um, have a look at some data and, uh, and then uh, let's think about policy. Uh, in terms of data, I just wanna give you, this is gonna be just a graph for the US, uh, but there are data available for other countries. And I want to just make the point that if you look at real-time data that have been uh, um, that have been uh, uh, used uh, in a bunch of new paper, um, for example, for spending or also for employment, this is a this is a graph from a paper by Natalie Cox and co-author that used credit card uh, data. Uh, you can see that there is a drop for different sectors. On the left hand side, you have the essential, uh, and on the right hand side, you have the non-essential sector. That overall you see a drop in spending in all the sector with a lot of heterogeneity. So there are going to be some sectors that are hit more directly that are going to suffer a bigger, large, larger drop in demand as expected. 
So for example, think about accommodation here, the blue, the blue line uh, clearly is one of the most affected sector. But even sectors uh, that are not directly affected, like, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, clothing, look at the, uh, at the, uh, the green line here, uh, has been dropping a lot. Okay, so there has been a, 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 a war, uh, like a pretty um, spread out drop in spending in all sectors, so directly or not directly hit, that kind of speak in favor of the fact that this shock is transmitted to the, all, to the whole economy. So the question is, what can we do in terms of policy? What is uh, best to do? Now, of course, if we believe that we are in a, in a situation where actually the pandemic is a tension su supply shock, so there is some sh shortage in demand, uh, expansionary policy in general uh, is something beneficial for the economy. But the question is, uh, which type of policy is more effective? So let's start thinking about the, the government spending. Okay, so this is the um, budget constraint for the government. G is government under government spending. And then TA and TB are targeted transfer to workers in sector A and workers in sector B. And D is that. Now, let's consider a small increase in government purchases financed by debt and future taxes on B workers. We can see that in the, in the paper we show that in this case, the fiscal multiplier on government spending is going to be equal to 1 which is smaller than the standard multiplier that typically is bigger than one is new, in new Keynesian models, where shocks are symmetric. So why is that? Uh, it's, uh, the fiscal multiplier is not as large and is, as in other uh, standard model. Uh, the reason is that uh, the typical mechanism uh, that creates a second round Keynesian cross that amplifies the effect of government spending uh, uh, is uh, not as effective when the shock is asymmetric, in particular because uh, the workers in sector A now, who are the ones that are hit by the shock, are not going to be reached by the, this type of policy. Because if sector A is uh, uh, shut down, uh, sector, the, the government spending is going to happen only in, in terms of goods of sector B. This means that this is going to increase the income for workers uh, working in sector B, who are actually the low marginal propensity to consume guys. And then this is going to increase their demand uh, and, their, and their income. But it's not going to achieve the income of the many unemployed workers in sector A, who are the ones that have the high marginal propensity to consume. So in a sense, this is uh, um, just uh, similar in the spirit to the argument in the job market paper of Christina Patterson, who emphasized that the fiscal multiplier is large in recession because there is a correlation between uh, the sensitivity to the shock and the marginal propensity to consume. In, in our model, is the reverse. It's a similar argument in reverse. Here we have a negative relation between the sensitivity of the uh, of being a bene beneficiary of beneficiary of the government spending and the marginal propensity to consume. So the ones who get uh, the benefit of their spending are the ones with the lowest marginal propensity to consume, so this dampens. Now, going back to our two-sector figure, so what about other types of fiscal policy? Uh, well, then, of course, I mean, of course, I mean, it, it is a, uh, uh, in this framework, uh, we can see that the, the problem of uh, fiscal spending is that actually those workers in sector A who don't have income and may not be able to borrow are not reached by this standard fiscal multiplier who is going to just uh, going to be spending in sector B and so it's going to uh, result all in increasing income for sector B workers. So they instead, what can be beneficial in this framework is really transfers so direct targeted to the workers in sector A, who are the ones that are mostly affected in this recession and are the ones that are insurance. So insurance here are, uh, be are beneficial and uh, it's because of the asymmetry of the shock. And uh, so let me uh, write down uh, uh, targeted transfer to workers in sector A as uh, the, the uh, product of a replacement rate law and the level of employment and bar uh, before the shock. So what is interesting is that if we have the replacement rate on the x-axis here and we look at output, 
we can see two cutoffs, row prime and row double prime. There is a first row prime cutoff where such that if row increases below row prime, output is going to increase because we know that there is shortage in demand and the lack of full employment in sector B. So increasing transfers is going to help that. At the same time, it's going to help in welfare as well, because it's going to also, on top of increasing economic activity, increasing insurance. But if we keep increasing raw after raw prime, after raw double prime, output now achieve the full employment level. So it doesn't increase. But yet, uh, in welfare keep increasing, because even if we are at the full employment, uh, uh, there is an improvement in welfare because workers in uh, uh, sector A can in increase their insurance. And the uh, raw double prime is the other cutoff where we achieve full insurance and then welfare is going to decrease after that. Okay, so raw prime to get the uh, uh, full employment, we don't need a 100% replacement rate because actually sector A is closed. So people don't need the same income as before to spend uh, achieve full employment. You only need to spend in sector B. But uh, uh, to achieve social insurance, full insurance, you actually need uh, Depending on the, uh, the on the design of the uh, taxes in our in our uh, the way we did it, you actually need 100%. You definitely need the replacement rate that is higher than the one that gives you. So uh, uh, to sum up, targeted transfers here are good not only because they increase economic uh, output, but also because they improve social welfare. That is uh, one of the problems in uh, when the shock is asymmetric, um, and they are in complete mass. So uh, overall, there have been, fortunately, uh, there have been many fiscal packages all over the world, in the US, in Europe, uh, um, in China, and the, the, uh, these fiscal packages have included a different uh, uh, way of providing uh, targeted transfers. Uh, so this is a for, and, and they have, be, I, I believe they've been proven to be uh, successful in some, uh, to some extent. So this is uh, um, just for the US. The CARES Act, so this is a, a figure from a, a paper by Raj Chetty and co-authors who use microdata, administrative data um, uh, for uh, on spending. And they uh, and I, I, I think this graph is a good way to, to see that the CARES Act that included both expansion in unemployment insurance and targeted uh, uh, business support um, was uh, effective in uh, providing more insurance. How do we see that? So the green line here is spending for the uh, top quartile of the distribution, the rich, and the blue line here is spending for the bottom quartile of the distribution, the poor. So you can see that uh, the spending of the rich has been actually hit hardest, uh, by the recession. What is interesting, although the income of the poor has been uh, hit harder, uh, as you can see from employment data that I'm not showing, but uh, what is interesting here is that when uh, the CARES Act uh, was implemented, there has been a recovery in spending of the poor, who are the uh, most recipient of the CARES Act, much more than the, than the rich. And so this is a kind of a sign that this insurance uh, uh, mechanism uh, is at work, was at work. Now, uh, before moving to monetary policy, I want to make a last point about fiscal policy. So, so far, I have not mentioned uh, health at all in a direct way, right? So, in my model, the pandemic is a pure asymmetric shock. Behind the scene, of course, there is a health dimension that matters. And for example, I've talked about possible lockdown. So to make sense of this world and this, uh, of this policy, you need a, a health dimension in the model. So we have an, ex and, and I think it's interesting to think about the complementarity between fiscal policy and public health policy. So if we introduce a health dimension in a simple way in the modeling preferences, where people care about uh, consuming in sector A, which is the eye contact intensive, because if they go more to restaurant, they get sick more with higher probability. Uh, they care about working in sector A, because if they go work as waiters, they may ever get sick with higher probability. They care about the total level of activity in sector A, because if more people are in the restaurants, there are, there are more tables around, there is a higher chance to get infected. So this is a standard health externality. And then this is a just a dummy uh, pandemic or no pandemic. So if we introduce this health dimension, now there are three issues that policy can address. One is a possible 
demand shortage in sector B that I emphasize in our main results. Second, there is lack of insurance. And third, there is now also the health externality. So is it um, efficient to shut down sector A or not? There are now, of course, two ten uh, there is a tension between two forces. There is a Pigouvian externality that would tell us that probably reducing activity in sector A is good to reduce the spreading of the virus. But there is also a, uh, our Keynesian wage operating uh, that if you reduce activity in sector A, you may have inefficient uh, reduction in activity in other sectors that where the, the spreading of the virus is not affected. And so it depends on the on the relative size of these of these two uh, forces. But what is more interesting is that in this uh, world, uh, uh, targeted transfer achieve uh, first best. Uh, why? Not only because they're going to help with economic activity, with stimulating demand in sector B, not only because they're going to help in stimulating, uh, um, in creating more insurance for the targeted workers, also because there is a complementarity, as I once mentioned, in between the, um, between, uh, uh, the fiscal policy and the public health policy in the sense that providing targeted transfers to those sector that are uh, more responsible in spreading the virus reduces the cost containment policies like lockdown or partial lockdown. And so this is going to uh, possibly make this policy more desirable, which may be overall uh, beneficial for the economy to reduce the spending. Now, how about monetary policy? Uh, well, first of all, let's think about uh, uh, the standard uh, stimulus effect of monetary po conventional monetary policy. If we think about conventional monetary policy, the uh, main argument is similar to government spending, meaning that monetary policy can, uh, is beneficial in the sense that we live in a world where the pandemic is a Keynesian supply shock, there is shortage in demand that is inefficient in sector B, and so monetary policy is going to help stimulating demand in the in demand and so achieving uh, and can achieve full employment. However, it's not going to be able to help with insurance directly. Right, because uh, because monetary policy is gonna be uh, is gonna be not targeted, is gonna not gonna reach in our model sector A workers, given that uh, sector A is shut down. So there are more broadly two, two challenges that monetary policy face um, that are uh, how do we think about inflation? Okay, so the in our model there are potentially different signals. Uh, uh, from inflation that comes from different sectors, because in sector B, you're going to see a drop in prices huh, because there is the, if there is demand shortages, but in sector A, you may see an increase in prices. So there are going to be some sectors, think about the toilet paper, where there is going to be shortage of supply, where you're going to have a supply and increase in prices, but there are going to be other sectors like retail, online shopping, and so on, where you can see a drop in prices because of the shortage in demand. Okay? And then, uh, even uh, uh, even to complicate more things, there may be some goods that are missing. For example, the price of a, of a football match ticket may be the same, it's just that the goods is not available. So how do we think about that? Right? So the, it's going to depend then if you are going to think about that. If you think about inflation in terms of a measure of slack, then maybe it's good not to look at the goods that are missing and think about the measure CPI overall. That is what you see that are the price of goods that are traded. And if you and and in that sense, this is going to tell you if there is need to stimulus. On the other hand, you may care about inflation also, also as a measure of cost of living. In that case, instead, you want to introduce back the uh, goods that are missing because that matters for the value, uh, the cost of living of, for welfare measure of inflation okay so in, in more more broadly it, what uh, what happens here is that some inflation may actually be just the symptom of the fact that relative prices need to change to uh for, because terms of trading are changing so it's a signal of a change in terms of trade okay now how about uh, uh the, i mean uh, there is a, a uh, other models. So there is a, an interesting uh, a new paper by uh, Woodford uh, that actually has a model in a similar same spirit of ours, but with, but with multiple sectors uh, where agents may have different spending composition, and uh, you can uh, um, where actually monetary policy can backfire. And you can see that if you think about our model and think about that you have multiple sectors, some that are more complementary. 
uh, they produce goods that are more complementary to the one that shut down and some that are more substitute and spending are different. And because monetary policy is just homogeneously affecting all these sectors, you can see that things can go either way. Okay, so I think that's an interesting paper. In our paper, monetary policy is always beneficial. Now, if uh, there is beyond the standard stimulus effect of monetary policy, uh, we think that I think that there are other dimensions in which monetary policy actually uh, may have positive effect on the economy. And in particular, more thinking about the medium run. Why? Well, because one drug for the recovery are potential losses that comes from job destruction or from business exit. And we have these two extensions in the model. For example, think about labor earning. Uh, uh, like when, if you have some value in a job matches, uh, so if it's if it is costly to find the right job match, and uh, when you have a, so some shutdown in some sector, you may want to keep alive the job relationship and try to provide uh, uh, um, stimulating firms to keep their workers on the books so that when activity can resume, they don't have to pay the extra cost of finding a right match. And so this uh, uh, is uh, it may be good because uh, it's not only providing the same social insurance uh, can be provided with targeted transfers because now the workers are not losing their income, but it's also good because in the medium run when you have a recovery, this may speed up things. Now monetary policy here helps because it's gonna in a sense making the horizon for business longer, right? By reducing interest rate, and even more. Uh, in uh, if we think about this effect of monetary policy, even more targeted monetary non-conventional monetary policy like the liquidity provision or credit provision may actually even be more effective. There may be other policy that can help uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, incentivizing labor earning, for example, a more fiscal policy like Kurzarbeit uh, in Germany or tax uh, integration in Italy and so forth. Uh, uh, like one drug of these policies that uh, if we think that there is some uh, structural transformation in uh, this uh, is happening uh, in response to this type of shock, uh, actually these policy are gonna kind of sclerotize the, the, the economy a bit. Now you make make them more temporary and, and, and that can partially solve the problem. But monetary policy or credit easing or liquidity provision may be a more effective way of uh, helping the jobs uh, that are going to self-select themselves by their future prospects. So let me conclude. Uh, what we uh, uh, what, what, what we want to emphasize is that the pandemic is uh, um, a shock that is asymmetric to the economy. This is our main point. We think it's important to think about the pandemic in a multi-sector model. And that why it is important? Well, because economic activity is going to reduce in sec some sector directly hit by the shock. And it may be efficient that that happened, but you still may have feedback effect on the other sector in transmission of the shock that may generate demand shortages. Where and so this may make uh, policy important. Now, which type of policy? Targeted transfers are uh, the um, are are, are going to be more beneficial than uh, government spending or conventional monetary policy in terms of stimulating. Uh, uh, demand in sector B because not only are going to uh, achieve higher level of economic activity, but also providing social insurance. And in a situation where the shock is asymmetric, social insurance, and, and there is lack of incomplete markets, social insurance is particularly important. But monetary policy may actually be important if we think about more in terms of uh, the fact that it's lengthening, uh, like making the horizon of firms longer because it may help in preventing uh, a job and business destruction, so it may be import, more important uh, uh, if we think about the medium run effect. Thank you. Many thanks, Veronica. Um, so please send me your questions via the chat function, and while they're coming in, um, let me just start with with uh, one question, Veronica, which is. Um, so you highlighted the importance of these exposed targeted transfers. Um, so how how should we think of uh, the design of unemployment insurance through the lens of your model? Uh, because typically that is a more blanket form of ex uh, arrangements, yeah, so and you seem to suggest it should be more targeted. So I think unemployment insurance is 
uh, not the perfect way of achieving targeted, but is a good uh, uh, sub is a good way of uh, achieving targeted insurance here because uh, there is going to be the most unemployed people are going to be in the targeted sector. So I see the extension of unemployment insurance uh, in, uh, as a good as a like a, uh, um, a policy in line uh, with the objective of achieving targeted uh, targeted uh, transfer, the way of achieving. There is going to be more unemployed people in the targeted. Um, another question is, um, when you speak about monetary policy, of course, you have uh, a more narrow um, construct in mind than um, what central banks, uh, many central banks are doing in the form of uh, beyond interest rate policy, um, asset purchases and the like. So to the extent that asset purchases also um, affect uh, fiscal policy, which you so thinking about, let's say, an EMU context, um, would, you, uh, would your policy takeaway slightly change in terms of yeah, effectiveness? Yes, so of course. I mean, we, we, don't, we have a, a very uh, stylized way, I mean, simple way of thinking about monetary policy. So, of course, uh, in, in the dimension, it, it is very important uh, that uh, there is fiscal space for governments to do these fiscal policies that help uh, achieving insurance and uh, and stimulated economic activity and so of course any policy that any, anything that the central bank can do to help uh, giving more room in this fiscal space is quite important on top of uh, also uh, as i mentioned before i think uh, helping uh, um, i mean we don't have any explicit uh, liquidity problem of businesses in the model but uh, for example in the model we have an extension where we think about possible ex uh, like endogenous exit and possible cascade uh, effect on businesses and so there are clearly uh, here problems uh, of uh, surviving in a moment in which you have a lack of demand and so uh, providing as i was mentioning like uh, some uh, like in general more liquidity and and and, and reduce the cost of credit uh, in the economy is going to help uh, in, in this dimension as well reducing this effect of uh, demand the chains that can uh, disrupt the economy especially in the, uh, even more in the medium run yeah so so also so, so let's say the ecp type of actions in credit markets would also help to complete markets right yes okay so another question is coming in from um klaus masuch um he says uh if targeted fiscal transfers are more efficient than expansionary monetary policy, would it be a problem if monetary policy is providing subsidies to banks? Um, could over time maybe reduce fiscal space? Um, so, um, so, what, so basically, he's asking about you know uh, the scope for targeted fiscal transfers to workers hit by the by the shock more directly. Sorry, uh, uh, policy on, on banks or workers? No, so if you have, if basically the, uh, if you make um, monetary policy, so if fiscal transfers are more efficient than expansionary monetary, po monetary policy, could it be a problem that if monetary policy is actually indirectly providing subsidies to, to banks, uh, that, well, that, I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess in, I mean, the, the over time the, you reduce the the scope for for these targeted fiscal transfers that in your model are more efficient. Yes, I mean, uh, I guess I, um, as you were mentioning also a minute ago, I mean, we take uh, um, market incompleteness as given. So uh, of course, uh, anything that uh, can help also uh, improving in that dimension, and so. Uh, maybe make uh, making bank more willing to to lend to workers and and so on can relax that uh, uh, incomplete market uh, from it from a different angle instead of uh, directly introducing targeted transfers ex um, uh, assuming that that incomplete market are given so uh, I, i'm sympathetic to the to to that possible to that possibility as well so targeted transfers are one way to so the the, the objective is to uh, 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 reach those workers who lose their income and uh, try to make sure that they can spend. And then so you can do that either by the targeted transfers, you can do that uh, by helping them being able to borrow uh, uh, more. And so that in that sense, uh, improving the financial uh, 
uh, setting uh, can can help as well. Okay. Um, so thanks a lot, Veronica.